Welcome back. In the last segment, we saw how we could reason about the three-dimensional geometry of a scene, whether that be a planar surface or a full three-dimensional model. In this segment, we're going to talk about temporal dynamics in the three-dimensional world. And in particular, how can we reason about the motion that we see in a video sequence? And it's going to be very specific and probably, frankly, not that applicable on a day-to-day -day basis. But I want you to see the underlying technique as a way of thinking about how we might analyze temporal dynamics in a video. So let's start by watching this video. OK, uh, that is me on the basketball court, about half court behind the back. That's my grad student um, walking towards it. And there's a befuddled kid in the corner out there wondering what we're doing there. Uh, looks like a pretty amazing shot. I'm actually not, for the record, a particularly good basketball player. Um, but you know, we see these types of things all the time on YouTube. YouTube is littered with these types of things. And, and just found a whim a while back, we started thinking about, how, how could you analyze these? And again, you know, we don't really care about basketball shots on a day-to-day -day basis. But understanding how you can analyze temporal dynamics, I think, is interesting. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we want to analyze the trajectory of that ball as it flew through the air, went out of the field of view, and then into the basket. And so we can think about this essentially as a two-dimensional problem. Because if we assume that there's very little wind, that ball is basically moving in a single trajectory in a plane. Now, I don't know where that plane is relative to me. We'll come back to that later. So the ball actually goes up and, and then eventually comes down. Okay, so that's the basic uh, uh, trajectory that a ball will have, and it will be in a plane. And there's really just two forces. Again, if we, if we ignore wind resistance and spin and all that, there's the initial velocity with which I launch the ball. And there is gravity, of course, gravity acting downward. And so what happens is initially the initial velocity is high. It, it defeats gravity, but gravity eventually takes over. And then gravity wins, and the ball comes back down to Earth. OK, turns out you can write a really beautiful equation to explain this trajectory. Again, assuming no wind resistance, no spin, no other external forces other than initial velocity and gravity. And that is a parabola. Uh, the y position, which I'm plotting on the vertical axis, is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, where x is the position along the horizontal axis. And again, out in the physical world, we're going to assume that this trajectory, the ball is moving in some plane in the world. Again, where that plane is relative to the camera, that remains to be determined um, in a little bit. So what we're going to do now is try to reason about this trajectory because we have a parametric model of what we expect it to look like. So if something is moving under the influence of gravity and initial velocity, it should follow a parabolic trajectory. All right, so how could we do this? Well, we could isolate the position of the ball in, say, a bunch of positions. And then we can ask, does it satisfy that equation? And for now, let's assume that the ball is moving in a plane that is parallel to the camera. So there's a plane. So imagine I'm exactly at the halfway mark in a court. And the ball goes like this. Now, that's obviously a very specific case, but let's stick there. And then we'll worry about the case where it's moving away from me or towards me at an angle. Okay. So we're going to isolate the position of the ball. Um, that is essentially the position in the 3D world, because we've already just agreed that it's in a plane. And so that means that this position at x1, y1 should satisfy y1 is equal to a x1 squared plus b x1 plus c. I know this position. I know this position. I don't know a, b, and c. And of course, I repeat that, let's say, three times. Why three? Well, I have three unknowns, A, B, and C. And I want to ask, is the ball at every position that I can observe consistent with the trajectory? And for now, let's just stick with A, B, and C. We'll worry uh, with three uh, points. We'll worry about more points later. OK, so uh, take a video. Ball is moving in plane. Isolate three points. It doesn't have to be three consecutive. It can be anything, any point, right? This is just an x axis, y axis. And now we're going to ask, what is the a, b, and c, that is the parabola that describes the trajectory of that? And is it, in fact, a parabola, which would be consistent with uh, initial velocity and gravity acting downward? OK, well, this looks pretty clean. It's a linear system. I've got the x's that I know. I've got the y's that I know. I've got three unknowns, a, b, c. They're all being multiplied by a scalar value. They're all being added. This is a linear system. This is easy to solve. All right, let's do it. Uh, three vector, y1, y2, y3. That's the left-hand side of those three equations. I've got my a, my b, my c, the unknowns that multiply the vector of the square of the x positions 
the x positions, and then of course just one for that last additive term. All right, let's put this into a matrix. We've now done this over and over again. I have my three unknowns here, A, B, C. I've got my x1 squared, x1, 1, so that times that is equal to y1. That's the first equation. x2 squared, x2, 1 times that is equal to y2. That's the second equation, and so on and so forth. Three by three matrices, we love square matrices. We love square matrices because we can invert them. So as long as this is not rank deficient, as long as these x's um, are not exactly the same, then we will simply be able to invert that matrix, solve for the parabola, and then we can compare that parabola to every point um, on the trajectory. How do we do that? I've got a vector y here. I have a three by three matrix M here. I have an unknown vector U. Uh, again, if that matrix is invertible, which means I have three distinct points on the horizontal axis, left, in, left multiplied by M inverse, so I've got M inverse Y is equal to U, and I now have my three parameters of a parabola. And now I can do, basically just map out that trajectory and see um, whether it works. Um, so I can look at every point and see if it falls on the trajectory consistent with A, B, and C. Now, I could have done more than three points. I could have done at least squares. All that is fine. But it's really constrained what I just described. So by way of intuition, that was, that was exactly what we wanted. But what was the constraint? That the plane of the ball's motion and the camera sensor are parallel to each other. right? So I'm at the midway line. And there's exactly the, the ball is moving in front of me like this. Now, that's obviously not always going to be the case. And so before I get in, let's talk about how do you generalize this to arbitrary uh, relative positions of the camera relative to the ball. All right, so here in three space, you can see that the trajectory in the yellow is again following a parabola. I'm going to parameterize this a little bit differently. I'm going to change notation here. So P sub T, which is the 3D location of the ball at any point T, is equal to P sub 0, that's the initial position, plus V times T plus one-half at squared. Notice that this is still a parabola in t. There's a t squared term there, there's a t term there, and there's a p0 term here. I've just replaced the variables a, b, c with, we know that there's a constant term, which is the initial position p0. We know that the linear term is the velocity of the ball, and we know that the quadratic term is one-half a. This just comes from the physics of a ballistic motion as a ball leaves your hand. So I can actually have the physical components in there, but you can just think of them as scalar values. All right, now, here's the situation that I just described earlier. I've got the trajectory in yellow of the ball, and I have the sensor in red are perfectly parallel to each other. So that is that red plane is parallel to the xy plane and perpendicular to the z plane. Now, no guarantee of that, but when that happens, what happens in the image is that a parabola in the world well, it gets imaged to a parabola in the image. So the Q in the image is just a scaled version of the P in the world, which is why in the previous slide, which we just did for intuition, I can just fit this to a parabola and ask, is this parabolic or not? And everything is really simple. So notice here, by the way, I put the camera center behind the camera. The sensor is in the front. We did that in the background section so to, get, to get rid of that inversion that results from perspective projection. Now, in reality, that's not going to happen very often. In reality, my camera is going to be tilted a little bit, or the world will be tilted relative to me. And now, Q sub t is, in fact, not a parabola. Well, why? Well, I've taken a parabola, and I've smashed it onto a non-coplanar plane, and now it's not quite a parabola. And now, the technique that I just described earlier no longer works, because we're not looking for a parabola. We're looking for something else. Well, what are we looking for? Well, let's see. We still have two planes. Yeah. The parabola in the world is in a plane. That hasn't changed. And the sensor's a plane. That hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is the relative orientation of them. Well, what is the relationship between something in a planar surface in the world and a planar surface in the image? It's a homography. We've already done that with the license plates uh, in the previous segment. So the cues the position of the points in the image are related to the position of the points in the world, the parabola, by a homography, H. We like homographies. They're three by three matrices. We love square matrices because they're invertible. So things have gotten a little bit more complicated. I can't just fit a simple parabola. That doesn't work. But they haven't gotten full-blown co complex in terms of this is a full-blown projective 
uh, projection, it's only related by a homography. And let's see what we can do about that. All right, so let me remind you where that homography came from, although we've now seen it a few times. I've got my image coordinates, x, y, with my homogeneous coordinate, s there, is equal to my conversion factor, lambda, that tells me how to go from meters to pixels. I have my uh, intrinsic matrix. I've added a few terms here, alpha and beta. This is the more general version. You can assume alpha is one and beta is zero. Focal length and camera center. This is a slightly more general version of the intrinsic matrix than we've been using before. I have an extrinsic matrix, which is a three by three rotation matrix and a three by one translation vector and a point in the world X, Y, Z in homogeneous coordinates so I can bundle up rotation and translation. Now, we just agreed that the Z component, we can assume the Z component of this is zero because this thing lives in a world, in a plane in the world, the same way we did with the license plates in the previous segment. Once I do that, the third column of here is going to vanish. So I, now I have a three by three matrix here. Here you can see I've simplified my intrinsic matrix. I've gotten rid of the alpha and the beta. These, by the way, are just tell you that your pixels are not necessarily square. That's all it is, but we can ignore that for now. And now I have a 2D to 2D or in, in non-homogeneous or 3D to 3D in homogeneous transformation. That of course is invertible. Why is invertible good? Well, because we can reason about the world from the image without actually that much hard work. So notation is that uh, little p, point in the world, is equal to lambda, scale factor, k, intrinsic matrix, m, extrinsic matrix, big p, point in the world. And this the whole thing multiplied together, of course, is a scalar times a three by three times a three by three. That's a three by three matrix. That is your homography. All right, so that means that a point in the world that lives in a plane, a parabolic motion, is equal to the projection via a three by three homography, the same way we saw in the previous segment. Okay, good. Now, so things are obviously a little bit more complicated. I can't just take a bunch of points and fit a parabola to and go home. I've got to do a little bit more work. So let's see what that work is going to look like. So again, you have the yellow, the trajectory of the parabola in the world. That's a parabola. It's projection into the image. Q sub T in red is a homography applied to those positions in the world. All right. So let me parameterize this now in the following way. Let's take, uh, so what is C in that picture right there? That's the camera center. Okay, so that's the optical center. Take a, take a line through, from the optical center through the position of the ball in the camera. By the way, I should have said this, but I think it's obvious, the camera stationary. It's not moving. Yep. And we'll come back to a moving camera in a little bit. So take a line from the camera center through the position of the ball that you isolate in the image and dr drag it outwards, and it's eventually got to hit the ball in the world. Yeah, let's call that line, that one of those lines, L sub T, T of course being the index of time. So T equals zero, T equals one, T equals two, T equals three, as we move through the parabola. Okay, so we have a bunch of lines. I've parameterized that, you can see over there is L sub T is equal to C, that's the camera center, plus S sub T, that's some parametric value that moves me along the line. We saw that, by the way, in the vanishing line and vanishing point uh, segment of this, times Q sub T, the position of the point of the world, minus C. That's just a parametric equation of a line. As S sub T moves, when S sub T of zero is zero, I'm at the camera center. When S sub T is one, I'm back at the point in the world, and I can, of course, move anywhere. So that's just a parametric equation of a line, and I can parameterize that line for every moment in time, okay? Now, what do we know? We know that if this is a true parabolic motion in the world, then I should be able to draw a line from the camera center through each point of the projection of the ball into the image, and it should land on a parabolic surface in the world. Yeah, that should be what's true if this is in fact a true parabolic motion. All right, so what that means is that the point in the world, P0 plus VT plus 1 half AT squared, again, that's the velocity in AR, the components of the parabola, should satisfy, there should be an S sub T that's, that, that I can move along that line that hits that point. So on the left-hand side of this equation is the position of the point in the world. On the right-hand side of the equation is me drawing a line from the camera center through the image and pushing out into the world and asking, when do I land at that point in the world? Now, lots of things going on here, but let's see how bad it really is. Well, let's see, T is known, time, frame, frame one, frame two, frame three, that's fine. C is known, let's say we know where the camera center is. 
Um, I certainly know what Q sub t is. That's the projection of the point in the world. So that's known. So I've got a bunch of knowns on here. And of course, a bunch of things that are not known. I don't know anything about the world. So I don't know where the point is initially. That's P0. The ball is initially. I certainly don't know the ball's velocity. And let's assume I don't know acceleration because it's in a unit and I don't know exactly which direction gravity is. Although I obviously know what gravity is. Let's assume I don't know that term. And of course, I don't know what ST is. That is, I don't know how much I should move along the line to get out to the world because that assumes I would know something about the world. But here's the good news. It's linear. Look at all the knowns and unknowns. Nothing, none of the unknowns are multiplying each other and all the unknowns are being multiplied by things that are known. So I'm not going to go through this. It's a big gnarly matrix, but this is taking the unknowns that you saw in the previous slide, the position, velocity, the, the, the components of the parabola of the parabola of the, of the trajectory ballistic motion, and those parametric equations along the lines. I've packed them into a vector here. I have this big gnarly matrix here, which is basically just taking the constraints that I showed you in the previous slide. And these are all the knowns here. The whole system is linear. Let's make it a super over-constrained system. So for every point that you can find, you build this linear system and you solve it using least squares. Very straightforward to do. And now we can analyze videos in the following way. I'm going to end up with two estimates, and this is important, two estimates of the parabolic trajectory. One is an explicit model in the world. That's P sub t. We were estimating P0, this component, and this component. So I get an explicit model. And then I get another uh, estimate, which is how much do I have to move along these lines in order to go out into the world? And if this is a true parabolic motion, well, then they should agree. So here, for example, you can see that I'm plotting the par parabola in three space. That's the yellow PT. And I'm also plotting in blue. It may be a little bit hard, hard to see on that black background, but they completely overlay how much the parametric uh, parameter had to move along the line to get to the parabola, and they're in perfect agreement, which says that what you're seeing in red is a parabola in the world up to a homography in the image. Here, you see a mismatch. The blue points are all over the place, so what you're seeing in the, in the image is not a homography applied to a parabola, and we can just quantify that by doing some type of, um, uh, some type of norm of the difference between these to quantify the difference. So notice what we're doing here. This is the real important take message, take home message is that we are reasoning about the three dimensional world, the motion in the three direct dimensional world using an explicit model of its motion. That's this and the projection of that motion into the image. In this case, it was a homography because this thing is moving in a plane. All right. So let's look at the video again. There's my backward shot. Um, and now let's analyze that and see if it's a, if it's real or if it is not real. All right. So what I'm going to show you here is the same game. Um, I'm taking all the red dots that you see in there are where I was able to track the ball in the image. We do that manually, but you can automate it. The yellow is the estimated parabolic trajectory per the system before. And those lines are showing you with a little blue at the end, whether what you are seeing is a parabola up to a homography. And in that case, it is exactly a parabola. The error is 0 0.014. By the way, the backstory to that is uh, we had gone out on the court, this is at Dartmouth College, to film a bunch of missed shots and we were going to fake them. That was my first shot. I went to half court, back of the head, back uh, behind my head. It went in and I thought, well, let's just go home because there's nowhere to go from here. So that was, in fact, a real video. And now let's just go ahead and show you um, a couple of other things. Um, ah, this is another way to visualize it. Um, so this is me over here in the corner. And what I've done is created a time lapse, time lapse uh, image where the ball is moving over the trajectory. Notice here in the top, by the way, the ball went out of view, but I have a parametric model. And so I can follow the ball. Where would it have gone? And then, and then it comes back out into the field of view, and it's exactly where we think it is. So the yellow is the parametric model of the estimate pushed through a homography back into the image, and the red dots are the track positions. If those agree, you have a parabola projected into the image. So just another way of visualizing what I showed you on the previous slide. All right, let's look at another video. This is downloaded from YouTube. Lots and lots of these videos, by the way.
There we go. Okay, not a particularly good fake, by the way, but let's go ahead and look at and see what happens to this uh, video. So, this is the same game. In yellow is the fitted parabola, and in blue are those extending those lines out, and now you can see a huge mismatch. So, the trajectory that we saw in the video does not follow a homography applied to a parabola in the image, and now you can tell it's fake. Here's the error, by the way. It's an order of magnitude worse, which is just the mismatch between those points. All right. Uh, this is just another visualization. Here you can see the red is the track position of the ball in a time lapse now, and the yellow is the best fit parabola mapped through a homography into the image, and you can see it's all over the place. This thing isn't even close to a parabolic motion. Now, um, in that video what you saw, sorry, it went a little bit of fast, uh, that was my graduate student Eric Key throwing the ball, and I was panning the camera. And so now things get a lot more complicated because what you're seeing in those red dots are the track points. And that makes no sense at all because the camera was moving and so I don't have a parabola mapped in through a homography. I've got a big gnarly mess because I've been moving the camera and one of the assumptions was I'm not moving the camera. So what do we do with the moving camera? So this is obviously a little bit more difficult but not unlikely you know, when something is moving over large distances, the camera is going to move. So here's the situation we're in now. We have a parabola. Nothing changes in the world. Parabola is still moving in a plane. We've got frame one where the camera is. That's C1 there. And it's looking at the scene. And that's the, the situation we just dealt with with a static camera. Now, next moment in time, well, the camera moves. And so now the projection is somewhere else. And then it moves again and then again and again and again. And so now what we have to do is, well, now the, can't, the, the, the orientation of the sensor in the world is different on every image. So we don't have that, homo well, we have a per frame homography, but that's not enough. Because to estimate everything, we need to have the ball visible in the same static frame over and over again so we can get lots of estimates. And we don't have that here because the camera's moving as the ball is moving. And so what we have to do, and I'm not going to go through the math of this because it's gnarly and it's hard to do, but it's, it's all in the published papers on this particular forensic technique, is we have to do full-blown camera calibration. So what we have to do is align every single image across time back to a reference frame, let's say the first frame. And that's done through a full-blown camera calibration where we estimate the rotation, and translation of the camera as you're moving it. The good news is, if you're assuming that the, the focal length is not being changed across time, you don't have to camera calibrate the intrinsic parameters, but you have to calibrate the extrinsic parameters. And that takes a little bit of effort. I won't go through the details of it, but let me show you that the analysis is in fact possible. So here's a video taken again from, from YouTube. Nice little shot by the kid. Camera is now panning. And we actually have two parabolas there, by the way, from the bounce and then another one. So let's go ahead and look at the analysis here. So this is the first parabola. This is the second parabola. The error is 0 0.0, 0 0.02, 0 0.05. This is actually authentic. You can see an overlay of the yellow and the blue, the yellow and the blue. So both of those trajectories um, are, in fact, consistent with a parabolic motion. This is the time lapse. It also shows you the camera calibration. So what we did is we took every single frame from across the sequence, and we created a panoramic. We registered everything back to the first frame, or maybe the middle frame, I don't remember which one we did. And now I can do a time lapse, there's the first bounce, there's the second bounce, and now what you're seeing is in fact going back to the original homography. Because now I have a single image. If everything's in the same reference frame, I'm back to homography, now we do the same technique as before. So basically think of it as sort of a front end pre-processing where you calibrate the camera, get everything into a frame, create a composite, and now you just have to worry about the double homography. Well, here it's a double homography par par parabola. All right, let's look at another example. This is maybe one of my favorites, um, just because of how weird it is. All right, guys in the trunk wearing a suit, suitcase, don't understand. This, by the way, epitomizes the weirdness that is uh, YouTube. So here you can see again, yellow is the world parabola, blue is the, traje the trajectory through the uh, image point, complete mismatch, error is on the order of 0.12, let's call it. 
And let's go ahead and do the, again, the stitching. The camera was moving on that one. The yellow is the estimated parabola. The red is the trackball. You can see they're a complete mismatched. Okay. All right. So again, you know, the number of times you're going to have to analyze a ball moving through the air is probably relatively small. Mostly this is YouTube pranks. We were interested in it because it was just sort of a fun and interesting exercise in thinking about how do we model and analyze 3D motion in the world. And so that's really the take home message here is um, that we understand the relationship between the world and the image. That's projective geometry, that's perspective projection, homographies. Um, to the extent that you can model motion, not just shape, but now motion, you simply take that motion and project it into the image through your, the correct uh, imaging model, whether it's full-blown perspective projection or homography, and then you can physically reason about the trajectories that you are seeing inside of the image. The hard part here is obviously the camera calibration for a moving camera, and then coming up with the generative models for motion. A ball thrown is particularly easy because it's ballistic motion. Airplanes, cars, people obviously have a more complex motion, but to the extent that we can quantify those motion, we can reason about their physical um, accurateness in the image by modeling the full imaging pipeline. All right, that's it for now. We'll see you in a little bit.